as we sing this hymn together. says, Christ be magnified, be made large, be uh, glorious in our lives. And so that's, uh, that's what this next song says. And um, so this, um, uh, this song here, as, I, I, as I've been thinking about this and I have been uh, praying about this song this week and introducing it to you here, Really, I, I pray that this is the, uh, the prayer of the church as well, that in our lives, that as other people see us, um, that his praises would be magnified, that um, in all that we do as, uh, as individuals and as a church body would glorify him. And so um, as you start to sing this song and you sing this chorus, I just ask that you uh, might pray that God would begin to stir these things in our hearts, um, that he would be made greater, that we would be less, and that he would be magnified. And so um, let's try singing this together, uh, these beautiful words that from north to, to south, to east to west, 
pray that the cry of our hearts would be Christ be magnified. So let's try uh, singing this together.
Good morning, everyone. For those of you uh, that may not know me, my name is Brett, uh, my last name is Tippy, and I serve as one of the elders here at Bridge Bible Church. If you're visiting us, I just want you to let, uh, to let you know I'm not the pastor, so you heard from Dave this morning. Um, and uh, so a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of preaching right here um, at Bridge Bible Church on a topic very close to my heart, which is missions. Um, it was my first ever opportunity to preach. Thank you for your patience with me as I, uh, and for being willing to let me uh, stretch my wings. Um, it was a pleasure for me. And um, because I don't have a whole lot of experience in this, I actually wrote a sermon that was twice as long as it should be. So thanks, Dave, for letting me do the, uh, the, second, uh, the second session this morning. So... Um, uh, I want to do a little bit of a recap of what we talked about last week, or last time I talked. It was the 4th of July, and we talked about patriots. Um, so we defined patriots as people who are passionate about their home countries, and they fight to defend the values of that country, um, as well as the, the country itself. We also talked about what happens when you remove the patriot from the patriot's home. Um, we discussed the similarities and differences that happen between expatriates and exiles. And if you want to hear about that, it's on the website, um, if you want to go back to those definitions. But we looked at missionaries as a different category of people. And does anybody remember what makes the missionary different from an expat or an exile? I'm a teacher. I like to, hear, uh, I like to get feedback. <laughs> anybody remember what, makes a, what distinguishes a missionary from an expat or an exile? Basically, three categories. Uh, we did talk about it being more a um, more a patriot of the kingdom than of the country. We looked in Acts 13, where where Paul and Barnabas are sent out by the church, and there are three things that they that three categories or three characteristics. One, anybody remember any any others? Now you're all afraid. Um, one is that they are called by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the second one is that they are sent, by a sent and commissioned by a local church. And the third one is that they go to preach the gospel. And we talked about what the gospel was and is. Um, and these are the things that set, um, set the, uh, the missionary apart from, the, um, uh, from expats and uh, exiles. Um, we also talked about, so you can see here Acts 13, where, uh, where those three categories or uh, characteristics are all in play. We also talked about the missionaries that Bridge Bible Church supports. So here are seven images of uh, missionaries that Bridge Bible Church supports. Well, one of them I didn't put up because I can't, I, I'm not even sure if I can put up uh, images for Chris and Monica given their situation. Um, we talked about the different types of missionaries that Bridge supports. Um, and, uh, and here are the other three. Um, so uh, pray for these people. Uh, they are doing God's work in very difficult places, every one of them. Um, so, and then we read Romans 10, uh, 5 through 15, and we discovered that while God has specifically equipped career missionaries, um, we called them capital M missionaries, like Craig Peters or Chris and Monich to preach the gospel and plant churches in foreign locations. We are also, what I want to make is the, the point that we are all called to be missionaries. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, today. We are all called to take the gospel to those around us who have not yet heard it. And I gave some very practical suggestions for how we can each be always prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. Um, so remember, brothers and sisters, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 20, 19 and 20, does not say, go missionaries, capital M, and make disciples of all nations. It says, go and make disciples of all nations. We can take that as a command for every one of us. Um, and we each have our own ways of, um, of doing that. So. Today I have two more points that I want to talk about in terms of missions, so we'll get the other half today. Um, but, uh, and basically it's going to be, we're going to talk about beautiful feet, yes, 
And the other one um, we're going to talk about is, i find the title in my notes, I didn't write it down, um, God's call to missions for uh, the church and for every believer. Um, so let's go back to Romans 10, uh, verses 5 through 15. Um, so I'll give you a, just a moment to get there. If you're looking it up in, uh, in your hard copies, actually I have found, I, I'm using my phone uh, these days mostly as my scripture copy, but what I found is that I can actually find the, the reference faster in the print copy. Um, it takes me a while to get through all the uh, options on my phone. Anyway, so let's read through. Um, for Moses writes about, uh, what, about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will ascend into the, the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because, here's that verse that I, uh, I recommended, if you, um, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you, uh, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Sorry, there it is. Um, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without, without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So let me give you a background, a little bit of background for why I'm so passionate about missions. Um, while we don't actively serve, did you see a picture of me and my beautiful wife? Um, we don't actually actively serve on the mission field right now. Uh, except as lowercase missionaries, which we talked about. Um, my wife, Rachel, and I have experienced the life of the missionary firsthand. Um, we both know what it's like to live in and minister in foreign cultures, um, in foreign languages, and our own walks with Jesus are enriched and expanded as we watch him moving in places that are not like ours. Um, so our, our view of the kingdom, I, um, I think I can speak for both of us, that our view of the kingdom grows as we see what God is doing in places that are very different um, from what we see here in Ohio. Um, when, I was first, uh, when I was in first grade, I remember a missionary came to uh, my first grade class in a public classroom, by the way. Um, that's how far we've come since then. Um, and... Uh, I rem she, um, this missionary was talking to us about her work in Peru. If you don't know where Peru is, that's on the, uh, the west coast of South America. Um, I remember clearly on that day that I felt a strange pull to be a missionary. I probably couldn't have described it this way at the time, but now I know that God was calling me uh, into missions. And while I was in college, I had the opportunity to go and spend uh, an extended period of time, seven months in Peru. Um, that missionary had moved on by that point, but I was able to interact with and see what God was doing in, um, in Peru at that, uh, at that time with new missionaries um, in that location. Um, and it helped me see how God moves in contexts that are very different from my own. Several years later, God's call on my life shifted, and I ended up in spending several years in Spain, and that's where you're looking at here. Um, uh, I was there for uh, several years working with a church uh, on a church planting team in the northern city of Pamplona, which is in the mountains right on the border with France. Um, and that's where I met my lovely wife, Rachel. 
Um, you can see us here in Pamplona uh, enjoying the famous running of the Bulls Festival. Um, and funny thing, in the photo, we weren't actually married yet. We weren't even dating. And that's a much longer story for another day. But I only ask that if you want, to, we're happy to share that story with you. But I only ask that you get both sides of the story because they are very different. <laughs> They're both true, by the way. Um, but uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Rachel's background. Um, she grew up in a family of missionaries. Uh, her parents were missionaries in a village in Mexico. Um, and her dad would literally uh, uh, cross mountains um, and, uh, and walk through swamps uh, on a horse uh, named, I don't remember, uh, Tortuga, turtle. Um, uh, and he would go from village to village training leaders to be uh, elders and pastors in their churches. Uh, many of you have had a chance to meet him. Um, so um, she also spent a year in, uh, in Peru as an intern missionary, and we were, happened to be there at the same time and didn't meet. That's part of that long story. Um, so <clears throat> then she also went on to Spain as a career missionary. Now, I was not there as a career missionary. She was there as a fully supported missionary as, uh, in the most capital of M's, uh, uh, as we might say. Um, uh, and I wanted to give you just a little bit of uh, a picture of the sacrifices that Rachel made to serve God in this way. Um, she went as a single woman, uh, which is frightening all by itself. Um, she went to a place where there were very few believers and even fewer believing men. And she did so at age 30, right? Uh, when most of her friends had already been married. Uh, this is the kind of commitment that Rachel made um, to serving her God and, and following the call on his li on, uh, in her life. Um, so she knows what it means to, uh, to uh, exercise great personal sacrifice uh, for the kingdom. And, um, but as a result of her sacrifice, women and children in Pamplona heard the gospel. And uh, we have a number of, uh, I could list a number of names that were impacted by Rachel's service and the ways that she loved them in that context. So Rachel and I, like Rachel's parents, or Craig Peters, or Chris and Monica Clinch, all and all the other missionaries that Bridge supports, were called by the Holy Spirit, commissioned and sent by the local church to take the gospel to people who haven't heard it. It is an, it, a, a challenging call to follow, but one that allowed us to see up close and personal the ways that God is building his kingdom in places very different than our own. Now, let's go back to Romans uh, chapter 10, and I, well, today I want to focus on the latter part of this scripture. Um, Paul asks a series of questions. They're rhetorical questions, and every time I read them, I think the beauty of these questions and how pointed they are and how much they, um, they spur us on to think about and be inspired to be involved in missions. So I'm thankful for this, even this very um, strong rhetorical device that he uses. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So to reiterate God's call for us to take the gospel to people who haven't heard it before, Paul quotes Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7, and Nahum, one of those Old Testament prophets that we don't talk about very often, in chapter 1, verse 15. Um, Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The, the version in Nahum talks about a messenger bringing news of the battle back to the, uh, the king and how, um, how joyful it is um, and how we rejoice at hearing the good news. Um, uh, but what I think is really interesting here is what does Paul call beautiful, Paul and Isaiah and Nahum? They call the feet beautiful. Now, um, normally we think of feet as ugly, stinky, dirty, 
hairy, full of all sorts of things we don't want to talk about, right? In fact, I did a, I typed into Google, um, I was doing an image search and I put in ugly feet and I turned it off as soon as it came up because it was disgusting. Um, and then I found these images which are much more, um, much less uh, abrasive, I think. Um, but you can imagine that as missionaries trek through unclear jungles or climb mountains or ford streams and traverse the streets of urban metropolises, their feet get dirty, their feet get stinky, their feet get sweaty. But why do Isaiah, Nahum, and Paul say that their feet are beautiful? It's because they are busy taking the gospel, the good news, to people who haven't heard it before. So in summary, at this point, when missionaries respond to the call of the Holy Spirit, are commissioned by the church, and faithfully expand the kingdom by spreading the gospel, they have beautiful feet, no matter what they look like or how they smell. So the next time you see Craig Peters, tell him he has beautiful feet. The next time you see when Chris and Monica come through, tell them they have beautiful feet. And Denise, I hope you don't mind that I say so. You have beautiful feet. Um, so what do we, those of us that are sitting here and living our lives in Northeast Ohio, um, what do we do with this? Um, so, and, and what is God's call to missions for the church, that's us, and for every individual believer? Um, so uh, while the call to serve as overseas missionaries is a special call of the Holy Spirit that he gives to those he especially equips for that task. We can all be beautiful feet or have beautiful feet. So let's talk about um, this call to missions uh, for the church and for every believer. The series of rhetorical questions Paul poses in Romans chapter 10 is one of the most poetic and often cited passages, passages for why we engage in missions in the first place. Um, but we have to look more broadly at its context in order to understand its full impact. Now, one way we can do that is following the footnotes in, the, in your, your text to look for where he's quoting. Uh, he's quoting Old Testament passages, uh, sometimes other New Testament passages. But the other way we can do that is look at the bookends. What comes before it and what goes after it? Well, before chapter 10 is chapter 9, and after chapter 10 is chapter 11. And that's one of the divisions, uh, those three chapters together are one of the, the, the major divisions of Romans. So we need to look at it within that context. It, um, uh, in other words, setting those uh, very strong rhetorical questions within this broader picture. Um, so this famous passage is embedded within a section um, where Paul's talking about Israel's unfaithfulness, which he lays out in these three chapters. So I've often asked myself, why does he put it here? If I were writing the New Testament, which you're glad that I didn't, if I were writing it, I probably would have put it together with, I don't know, the Great Commission, or maybe Paul's instructions to Titus and Timothy as they're going out to Crete and, uh, and Ephesus. Uh, to do these things. But instead, Paul puts it in the context of Israel's unfaithfulness. Um, so let's, let's figure out why. Um, so the closer I read chapters 9 through 11, the more and more it makes sense. I'm still getting there, um, as, as you can imagine. But um, long before Israel became a nation, God chose them. Why? as his people, to be a testimony to the nations of his love, his holiness, his faithfulness, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his provision, and his righteous judgment. So he chose them not just to make them special, but that they would be a light to the rest of the world. Um, his goal in choosing Israel, um, uh, and, and as God told Abram in Genesis 12, he said, in you all the families of the earth, or the nations, shall be blessed. So his plan was to use Israel as a means of bringing his blessing to all nations. Now, God originally chose Israel to be a hope 
for the nations. Notice I'm using a hope for the nations, not the hope. We'll get to that in just a minute. In Deuteronomy 7, he says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord Jesus loves you and is keeping this oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and has redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So we know he chose them because he loved them, but to what purpose? What were they supposed to do as a result of being, uh, of being chosen? Um, what was the function they were supposed to fulfill? So Moses underlines Israel, Israel's role in Exodus 19.6. Think about it this way, uh, just before he issues the Ten Commandments. Um, he says... Um, he describes them as a testimony to the nations by calling them a kingdom of priests. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So what's the function of a priest? The priest is essentially a bridge between God and people. And specifically in Israel's case, they were to reflect the image of God to all nations. But we know the story that Israel did not fulfill this, uh, this, uh, this covenant or their end of the bargain. Um, Romans 11.7 tells us that Israel failed to attain what they were, it was diligently seeking. Why? Because it was unfaithful and because they tried to attain salvation by works. Um, so God sent, there's that word again we mentioned before, the Latin word being missio, missionary, um, he sent Jesus, the Messiah, as the perfect demonstration of God's attributes and to be the perfect atonement for our sin. Um, so, in, in, and, and to be the greatest missionary of all. We know Paul was a great missionary, Barnabas was a great missionary, but Jesus is the one that left everything and came to live with us as God with man um, in, order to, uh, in order to not only preach the gospel, but to be the gospel and to, uh, and to save us from our sins. Um, so in Matthew 12, we see uh, Matthew quoting Isaiah 42, and he proclaims Jesus to be the hope of the nations fulfilling that role that Israel could not. Um, so he says, Behold my servant in whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles, that's everybody, will hope. He is the hope of the nations. Um, he is the perfect and eternal hope, the only hope that will never fail, that will never disappoint. And our role as followers of Jesus is to proclaim him as the hope of the nations and to take his gospel to places where it has not yet been preached. If all we do is hold on to the gospel and keep it inside this building, we are, not, we are just like Israel, being unfaithful to, uh, to carry forth our, um, the, the commands that God has given us. Um, so um, I should say we are, we are as unfaithful as Israel was in a very different way, but as unfaithful. Um, so... What I want, one thing I want to point out here is that we, the church, we are not the hope, but we proclaim him who is the hope. Um, echoing Deuteronomy's description of a kingdom of priests, Peter revisits this Old Testament command, frames it in the context of the church, and explains what we are to do as a result. And the, the key here is that we are to proclaim he says, 
But you are a chosen race, speaking to the, uh, the church, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And one thing I want to make very, very clear, I'm not going to dwell on this point, it's another probably whole series of, uh, of sermons that we can outline, that God is not finished with Israel. Um, there are those that believe that God is finished with Israel. Um, and I'm not the, the one probably to unpack for you all those, um, all those details. I think the, the other three elders are probably more prepared than I am to, to walk you through that. But um, what I want to say here very, uh, very clearly, though, is that the church has its own role to play, but the church does not replace Israel. Romans 9, 4 through 5, men, remember we have to look at the entire context, tells us that to Israel belong the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple worship, the promises, the patriarchs, and from them came our beloved Messiah. And in the end days, God will raise up a remnant from Israel to again proclaim this hope to the nations. Um, so, uh, like I said, I guess this is where I, I say, if you have any questions about how the church does not replace Israel, you can talk to one of the other three elders. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to walk through as, uh, as well as I can. Um, so, you see, it makes perfect sense that Paul would put this call to missions within the context of his discussion of Israel's failure to be a hope to the nations. Um, Ever since Genesis 12, he has destined his people to bring the light of the gospel into the entire world. First Israel, then we as the church, and finally Israel again in the end times. Isn't it nice how God brings everything always back around? He, he always fulfills his promises. Um, so, let's, what do we do with this? What are some, uh, some very specific points that we can take home and, uh, and, and do. Since this is two, uh, two sermons in one series, I, um, I'm going to remind you of the, uh, the two applications uh, points I made earlier. Uh, one, be an expat for the kingdom more than you are a patriot for the United States. Um, second, memorize Romans 10, 9, because the entire gospel is summed up in those 26 words. So uh, my point there on the other day uh, was to say when those, when those moments arise, and we do pray that they would arise, that you would have opportunities to share the gospel, um, it's a nervous thing. It's something that you get, uh, you, you probably, like me, you clam up. You all of a sudden can't think straight. All you have to remember is Romans 10, 9. Everything is packed within those 26 uh, words. Um, but let's move on here to the applications for today. Be one that sends. So what do I mean by that? We talk about missio. A missionary is one that is sent. Who does the sending? The Holy Spirit calls. The Holy Spirit moves in the heart of the missionary, and the Holy Spirit equips the missionary. The role of the church as a collective body and us as individuals is to send those missionaries out. Um, so, each one of us are called to be involved in missions, actively helping our brothers and sisters who are called to serve as these capital M missionaries. So, one way we can do this, one way we can send these people is to pray for them regularly. Um, whether they are currently on the field, let's say as... Um, uh, well, let's say Denise is getting back to the field this fall, right? Um, with much more, uh, much more ability to interact with the students at Kent State University. Or people that are not on the field, like uh, Dave mentioned today, uh, Chris and Monica are trying to get back to the field. Pray for them, um, no matter where, what their physical location is. Um, sign up for their prayer letters. If you go to our website, you'll see, um, you'll see who they are, they're all listed there, um, and, 
and sign up for their prayer letters so that you can know specifically how to pray for them. Um, uh, teach your children to pray for them. This is one of the, uh, the blessings that I have as a dad, is that um, the missionaries that Rachel and I support or the missionaries that Bridge supports, um, our boys know about them. Uh, and they know to pray for these people. They know enough about uh, what they're going through, what their situations are, that they can pray for them. Um, and also, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but Job has started a, uh, a series, I think, Job, it's on Facebook, right? Um, called Did You Know? Dot, dot, dot. And what we're doing through that series is um, in, what is it, 280 characters, we're communicating little facts about the places where our missionaries serve that give you an indication of how you might pray for those missionaries. So if, you, if you're not as sure where that feed is, just email Job. Uh, he'll be able to connect you with it. Um, also, if God has blessed you financially, support these missionaries with your finances. Um, when you commit to supporting a, a missionary financially, you become invested in their ministry. Your connection with them will grow, you will see the generous gifts, that you, uh, your generous gifts, helping them to expand God's kingdom around the world, and your view of God will grow as a result. Um, so there are a couple of ways you can do that. You could give to these missionaries by yourself, or um, you could give to our missions fund. Any, all dollars that go to our missions fund go to our missionaries. Um, so. Uh, that's an, uh, and you have a way to, um, to designate your gifts like that. Um, also, encourage the missionaries that you support and that Bridge supports. Write them emails. Invite them into your home when they're on home assignment. Missionaries are often bold people who, uh, who thrive in trailblazing work, but they are not immune to the attacks of the enemy. In fact, they often are more prone to the attacks because they are right on the front line of the battle. They need our encouragement. And it is encouraging, as a missionary, a former missionary myself, it is encouraging when the people back home send me emails to say, that even just simply, that they're praying for me. Um, uh, and and uh, also, um, in, in addition to being one that sends... Be one that is sent. We can all be sent as lowercase missionaries into our spheres. Um, but we as the four elders, I can, again, I'll, I'll venture to speak for all four of us here. We pray earnestly that God would raise up from Bridge Bible Church men and women who are called to serve as capital M missionaries. We pray that for you. Um, as individuals and as a group of elders. Um, ask yourself if God is calling you to go to expand the kingdom by spreading the gospel to people that have not yet heard it, to serve on a mission field. This could be as simple as becoming involved with one of the local ministries Bridge already supports, such as Broken Chains, or we all know that Tom Sipe is involved with uh, South Akron Youth Ministries. That is him participating in missions, uh, fulfilling uh, in a way that God has called him um, to, to missions. Or it could be to take part in a short-term mission trip where you can serve practical needs of your brothers and sisters in a foreign culture and also get a glimpse of how God is working in those faraway places. You'll be surprised how this kind of work will expand your own understanding of God's kingdom and it will enrich your own walk with Jesus. Or it could mean being willing to follow God's call to move to a foreign land, to learn a foreign language and a foreign culture, and to expand his kingdom as a capital M missionary. We do pray that uh, Bridge could be a sending church like that. If God is calling you in any of these directions, and we do hope that he is calling you in, in these directions, check out the series of short uh, videos that I've posted on the, the website, right, Job? Um, they're about five minutes to ten minutes long, and I go into a little bit more of these points in detail. Um, they will help you understand a little bit more about your role as sender and sent. And also, let one of the elders know that, uh, that God may be, call, uh, may be moving in your heart like this. Um, we are happy to, uh, to walk through that with you, uh, to encourage you, um, and to help you sort through what that call 
might be on your life.
mission field around us that as we leave this place,